so here, well, here's an outline of what we're going to what we're going to talk about. Um, we'll start by introducing the ideas of uh, what deviations from inter intended interventions are, and talk a bit about the role of blinding. Um, a particularly interesting and unique aspect of this domain is that we have different versions according to uh, the, the effect that we're interested in estimating from each study. And so we'll, we'll talk a bit about what those effects of interest are. We'll have a, a brief break for some questions about that topic, and then move on to the first of the two effects of interest, uh, the risk of bias and the effect of assignment to intervention. And we'll discuss that because it's the one that we're mainly using, and then talk about the risk of bias in, uh, in the effect of adhering to an intervention. Hopefully, we'll get through all that before the end of the session. Next slide, please. So this is a slide that we've been showing in all of our webinars. It's a depiction of a simple parallel group, individually randomized trial. And we use it to illustrate the five domains of bias, just so provide a quick reminder and overview and put this session into the context of the others. The first domain, Jonathan, is the bias arising from the randomization process. The second one is today bias due to deviations from intended intervention. Uh, the third domain is uh, trying to determine whether we've got missing outcome data and whether that's leading us to bias. And the fourth is around measurement of the outcome. And the fifth is around selection of the reported result. So click the uh, session today is about this domain and hopefully it'll become clear why we've got those little deviating arrows, um, devi deviating into and out of the, the interventions depicted there. Okay, next slide. So we're first going to talk about what we mean by deviations from intended intervention, and then talk about the role of blinding. So here's a graphic that tries to explain what we're talking about. The, the starting point is to think, well, what is the intended intervention? And I'm depicting this with a little picture here of a, a, a woman. Uh, maybe this is a trial of a vaccine. A, the, the provider of the intervention has got to do something that's intended and the participant is going to receive something and potentially do something that's intended. And the interventions are all an interaction of some sort between a provider and a participant. And it, we will want to know exactly what we intend to do. We may, for example, intend to vaccinate everyone in the study with the intervention, um, the, the vaccine active or placebo, for example, that we're interested in comparing. How might we deviate from that? Well, the first example here is where we have that the intervention provider giving additional interventions. So here, for example, uh, the, 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 the woman vaccinates the individual, but also for some of them says, now go to as many illegal raves as you can to get yourself exposed to a, as much virus as possible. And that might lead to, well, that's an intervention, like advising people to do something that might affect the, uh, the, the effect of the vaccine. The second area of deviations is where the intervention does not get delivered as intended, not implemented. So maybe the vaccine just doesn't get given. And then the third area is around what the participants do or do not do. And it's around non-adherence of trial participants. So on the one hand, they may just not, uh, not receive the vaccine because they refuse it, uh, or they might take it, but take additional interventions of their own accord. So we, we use these three areas to define the sorts of deviations of inter, intervention uh, from the intended intervention that might arise in a trial. In this next slide, I'm saying all the same stuff in words. Um, so the first area is administration of additional interventions by trial staff. And we will use the word non-protocol interventions for these. They're interventions that are not Accordant with the intended protocol for how the intervention will be delivered and rolled out. These non-protocol interventions will introduce bias in some circumstances if they affect the outcome, as we'll talk about in much detail later on. And if it's possible to specify the sorts of non-protocol interventions that we're going to be looking out for, we should do that in the protocol. But the second area, as I said, was the failure of trial staff to implement the protocol interventions as intended. And then the third area is non-adherence by trial participants to their assigned intervention. Of course, we're talking about intended interventions as if we knew exactly what would what, what is intended. 
the sad uh, reality is that very often protocols do not fully specify what was intended. And as review authors, we have to make some judgments, and perhaps do a bit of detective work to work out what was probably intended in, in these trials. Okay, next slide. I'll pass over to Jonathan. Thanks very much, Julie. So I think this slide is a really important one. And it's about things that are not problems and do not constitute or cause bias. Um, and in a lot of discussions in recent years, in the context of the rollout of uh, version two of the risk of bias tool, um, we've had discussions about situations in which intervention changes over time and there's a discussion about, well, does this constitute bias? It's really important to realize that in many, many situations, it is intended that interventions will change over time. So, for example, imagine a, uh, a trial in which, invest in, in which participants are randomized to a new drug uh, or, or an existing drug. Um, and the new drug uh, sometimes causes severe toxicities. The intention will be that any patient who experiences those severe toxicities should either receive additional care or switch to an alternative therapy. There is no bias there. That is simply part of the package of care that is being evaluated. And the fact of somebody stopping taking their drug because of the because they experience toxicities is simply not a bias. A second example, a second example is uh, in trials in which, for example, first line uh, chemotherapy for a specified cancer. It will generally be intended that participants whose disease progresses should switch to a more aggressive second line intervention. That is part of the package of care being evaluated. And unless the protocol explicitly mandates that participants should remain on their initially assigned intervention regardless of the progression of their disease, it is intended that uh, switching will occur and that is not biased. Changes such as this are consistent with the trial protocol, even if, as Julian says, the trial protocol is not explicit about the changes to intervention over time that are intended. They do not cause bias, and they should not be considered to be deviations from intended intervention. And um, by understanding this, we can avoid classifying perfectly good trials as at risk of some sort of bias, when in fact they are simply evaluating interventions as they are intended to be implemented in the real world. The problem uh, that I've alluded to um, in discussing the previous slide is that sometimes trial authors and the trial protocol may not fully specify when changes to the initially assigned intervention may occur. For example, a cancer trial protocol may not define what they mean by disease progression or explicitly specify the second line drug or drug combination that should be used in patients who progress. Or for a usual care comparator, a protocol may not specify the interventions consistent with usual care or specify when in the context of disease progression, uh, patients assigned to usual care should be uh, given more, in, more intensive or invasive intervention. And therefore, it may be necessary when uh, users of ROB2 are assessing risk of bias that at the stage of the protocol, users document changes to intervention that they do and do not consider to be consistent with the trial protocol, or describe interventions that are generally considered to be consistent with usual care, including switches to, for example, more aggressive intervention that might be expected to take place should disease progress. Now, an important um, change between version one of the risk of bias tool and version two, ROB2, is a more detailed consideration of the role of blinding 
in preventing bias and the, the relation of the presence of blinding and the risk of bias. So what should blinding of participants and personnel achieve during the conduct of the trial? Well, they should present contamination, prevent contamination, which is application of one of the interventions in participants who were intended to receive the other. They should prevent switches to non-protocol interventions, at least switches that are based on knowledge of the intervention received. And they should prevent non-adherence uh, by trial participants in a manner that is related to knowledge of the intervention received. Of course, some trial participants assigned to a course of, uh, of a drug will not take the drug. But in the presence of blinding, such non-adherence should not be related to knowledge of whether participants are receiving the active drug. So blinding of participants and trial personnel is, of course, a very important part of the conduct of, uh, conduct of randomized trials. However, we can argue that it's not appropriate if we're trying to conduct a pragmatic trial whose goal is to compare interventions in individuals who are aware of their care or when health professionals are, are aware of the care being received. On the other hand, blinding is essential in trials that aim to eliminate placebo effects and isolate specific effects of the protocol interventions, regardless of knowledge of the intervention being received. Blinding also has a very important role in ensuring that assessment of the outcome is not affected by knowledge of the intervention received. That is not part of the deviations from intended interventions domain that we're discussing this morning. It, blinding of outcome assessors is considered separately in domain four of the ROB2 tool. John, so we could break for a, a poll question at this point. Sure. Who manages the poll? Dario. Over to you, Dario. So the question is, will an unblinded trial, that means blinded uh, participants and carers in the, during the trial, not outcome assessors, be at high risk of bias? Let's get a sense of people's views on this. Okay. So, Jonathan, do you want to? Can you see the results, or shall I read them out? I can see the results. Shall I close the poll? Close it uh, right. So, um, interesting. So, 21% have said yes. An unblinded trial will be at high risk of bias. 39% will say have said usually. 39% have said sometimes, and 1%. 1% have said no. Um, and uh, our answer, I think, and I haven't checked this with Julian, but I hope we're in agreement, is the, we, we would say sometimes. It's a big change from version one of the risk of bias tool where high risk of bias was generally equated with uh, participants and trial personnel not being blind. So it is not the default in ROB2 that unblinded trials are considered to be at high risk of bias, or even usually considered to be at high risk of bias. Unblinded trials may be at high risk of bias, they're sometimes at high risk of bias, depending on um, deviations from intended intervention that we will describe a bit later during this webinar. 